Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, 1.01 p.m. and I'm going to call the June 7th uh, meeting of the Planning Advisory Committee to order. Uh, before I ask for an adoption of the agenda, I just want to uh, point out one uh, amendment that we have on today's agenda, uh, item 4.2 under deputations. Uh, Deborah Fletcher is being replaced with uh, Joe McCall. And that is the only uh, amendment to the agenda that I'm aware of. Um, committee, if I can have a motion to adopt the amended agenda. Councillor Warren, seconded by Mayor Elmsley. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. That brings us down to uh, item uh, number two, declarations of pecuniary interest in today's meeting. Uh, yes, I'd like to declare a, a pecuniary interest in the apartments 2023-030, uh, 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 the William Street North apartments, as uh, I have uh, sold some of the units uh, for MDM for the condominiums in Fenland Falls and uh, still awaiting some commission. So I feel I have a pecuniary interest uh, uh, against this, uh, speaking towards that, uh, that parcel. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Member Mike Barkwell. So that uh, pecuniary interest for item 3.2, Joel. All right, if there are no further pecuniary interests uh, for today's meeting, we will move into item three on today's agenda, the public meeting reports. Uh, item 3.1 is plan 2023-029, an application to amend the Village of Omimi zoning bylaw 1993-15 at 112 King Street West. Uh, Jonathan, you're up. Oops, sorry, just before you start there. Oh. We're going into uh, public meetings. Um, as required under the Planning Act, a public meeting is being held prior to the committee making a recommendation on these applications. The purpose of this public hearing is to allow the committee to gather information on the applications before us, to hear those wishing to make oral submissions on the applications, and to allow the committee to ask questions on the applicant, interested parties, and staff. Everyone who makes a presentation at this meeting is requested to state their name for the public record. In the interest of time, the committee respectfully asks that you keep your presentation to no more than five minutes. When called upon, please either unmute yourself and turn your video on or come to the podium and, and press the speak button. Um, so now we'll move into 3.1, application to amend the Village of Omimi zoning bylaw 1993-15 at 112 King Street. Now you're on, Jonathan. <laughs> hey, thank you, Chair. Here I was thought I was getting a uh, elaborate introduction. Uh, maybe maybe next time. Uh, Just trying to keep things moving. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Planning Advisory Committee. We have here in front of us a zoning bylaw amendment for 112 King Street in Omimi. We have on the screen a location plan showing the subject land. Move along to an aerial photo uh, of the property, uh, as well as here's the site plan. I'll leave this up uh, for the remainder of the presentation and just move it back if, if anybody has any questions. So the uh, the zoning bylaw amendment was submitted by EcoView Consulting um, on behalf of Gabe Spoltenny uh, to propose or to facilitate rather the development of a drive through restaurant on the C2-3 zone. This is a highway commercial exception three zone um, as under the Omimi zoning bylaw. Uh, it should note that this property is uh, zoned three ways. Uh, we have the commercial exception three zone, pardon me, highway commercial exception three zone. We have a residential type one with a holding provision kind of in the middle and then to the south, the southern third of the parcel, if you will, is zoned EP or environmental protection. Um, this notice of this application was given to residents and property owners within about 120 meters uh, as per the requirement. Uh, the proposed development 
as described before, includes a restaurant building with a drive-through, which we can see on the screen here in the gray. Uh, also part of the zoning bylaw amendment is a rezoning of lands to EP, Environmental Protection Zone, to acknowledge the presence of a provincially significant wetland. This rezoning of the EP zone reflects not only the delineation of the wetland, but also the required 15 meter buffer from that wetland. So within that 15 meter buffer, no development would be permitted. And this is shown on the site plan. Uh, the yellow line or the golden line here um, reflects the uh, boundary of the proposed EP zone. Submitted uh, in support of this application uh, was a planning rationale report, environmental impact study, a wetland delineation letter, uh, preliminary hydrogeological assessment report, a geotechnical investigation, traffic impact study, uh, a functional servicing and stormwater management report, and an archaeological assessment. All of these studies were circulated to agencies for technical review. I will note that at the time of writing the report, the um, pardon me, the traffic impact study was still outstanding uh, comments from MTO, uh, as well as some of the environmental studies from the Corth Region Conservation Authority. Um, since the writing of the report, these agencies have submitted uh, to us that they have no concerns with the proposed rezoning um, and then any finer details when it comes to um, the wetland uh, delineation um, or potential servicing concerns could be addressed during the site plan process, which this application would be subject to. Generally, this application conforms with the provincial policy statement um, as it is an intensification within a settlement area um, of currently undeveloped land. Uh, staff feel that this application demonstrates uh, efficient use of land and resources, and despite being uh, having uh, a private servicing item, uh, still demonstrates efficiency and uh, satisfies the intensification um, of Omimi. Uh, as per the growth plan, um, the vast majority of growth should be directed to settlement areas. As I stated before, this application is within the Omimi settlement area, uh, and it does offer a bit of uh, economic diversification uh, within Omimi. Uh, the City of Quartz Lake's official plan um, notes that the urban settlement area uh, designation is under appeal, so we default to the Victoria County official plan. Um, the there isn't. It's noted that there is a servicing constraint uh, within the municipality or within the city of Omimi. Um, the functional servicing and stormwater management report and hydrogeo assessment report that were submitted demonstrate that this application can be, or pardon me, this proposal can be adequately serviced. Um, we we did receive some concerns uh, about the traffic impact uh, as a result of this development. We are. Um, happy to say that through the Ministry of Transportation, uh, they have have they have issued no concerns um, with this application. So the rezoning um, would permit the drive-through use, as that is something that's currently not permitted in the Highway Commercial Exception 3 zone. So that would be the, the primary, uh, I guess, difference to the existing C2-3 zone. Uh, the lot area, the other development standards with regards to setback and gross floor area would all comply um, with, with no issue. Um, as such, uh, given the public comments uh, that were received, there were two emails um, that were received that were generally minor in nature, um, asking for further clarification on the proposed development and, and what's going on. Um, there were some concerns flagged about the the provincially significant wetland that exists on the property. Um, through the review with the Kawartha Region Conservation Authority, they have indicated they have no concerns uh, with the proposed wetland delineation um, that would sort of um, remove, or pardon me, not remove, um, eliminate uh, any potential concerns. Uh, with regards to traffic, there were some concerns raised uh, as well. Um, as described before, the MTO has issued uh, no concern um, with the traffic impact study and the proposed development. So um, you will note that in the staff report, staff were rec recommending referral back to address those outstanding comments or concerns um, from technical agencies. Um, if the planning advisory committee wishes today, um, staff would not object 
to um, moving this along for approval. Uh, fully understanding that um, there were two, I believe, two pieces of pieces of correspondence that were circulated to the Planning Advisory Committee um, regarding this application. I'm not sure if anybody is in um, attendance today, but um, as this is a public meeting, I'm happy to go through that process. And um, if there are any concerns, um, we can t we can refer it back. Um, if the committee wishes otherwise, we're also okay with moving it along for approval to council. Uh, and with that, I will ask or take any questions. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, committee, any questions of Jonathan at this time? Deputy Mayor Richardson. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Just one quick question, Jonathan. I'm just wondering, did the MTO actually ask for any extra entrance requirements at this time? Uh, check my notes here. I don't believe they asked for entrance requirements. There, it would be understanding that uh, an, an entrance permit would be required. Um, but as far as like detailed design, that has not uh, come up yet. Okay, great, thank you. Because I know I've had a couple of projects in the past where we've had to put holding symbols on just because of uh, certain requirements. Um, I'm at this time happy to uh, remove move the report um, back to. Oh, you're a little early. Just, we'll come back to you. Uh, committee, is there any further questions of Jonathan, Member O'Reilly? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Jonathan, I just wondered, uh, maybe it'd be more uh, appropriate for the applicant, was there any uh, question about uh, is there's going to be a gas station going in with this application now or later? I realize there may be one going in east of Omimi, but uh, just to you, if it was any uh, original one cause for traffic. I, um, through the chair, I can speak to that one. So a gas station is not currently a um, permitted use um, in the C2-3 zone. Um, so should that come up, then uh, we'd we'll be back here again <laughs> for another public meeting if that is something that uh, was desired. Any further questions of the committee of Jonathan at this time? Seeing none, does the applicant owner or agent on behalf of the applicant owner wish to speak to the application? Hello, uh, my name is Beverly Saunders. I'm the agent for the landowners. My, I work for EcoView Consulting. I'm the planning supervisor there. Um, uh, that was a great report, so there's not much I need to add, but I just wanted to clarify that the site-specific zoning right now actually allows for a 1,200 square meter building, and what we're proposing is 250 square meters. So just keep that in mind that the existing zoning would allow for a much larger building, which much more significant impacts in our opinion than what's being proposed by the change in zoning. And, um, and the zoning change that we're asking for, we're meeting all the other zoning requirements of the site-specific zone. We're solely asking for the drive-through to be incorporated into the use, primarily because drive-throughs aren't actually contemplated in the zoning bylaw. So the zoning bylaw has takeout restaurants, but it doesn't speak to drive-throughs. So there's not any language in the bylaw because of the age of the bylaw for us to ensure that this use is permitted under the zoning. So I just want to give that context that there is existing development rights and what we're proposing to do is a lot smaller in scale than what the existing zoning would allow for. Um, I did take a look at some of the public comments. Uh, Jonathan did a great job of answering most of them, but I'll just take a quick gander at doing a little bit more of that. So there are questions about flooding. Um, there is obviously a floodplain on the property that's been discussed previously, has been reviewed by Kawartha Conservation. We did review, get those comments back in advance of this meeting. We have submitted a technical study that we submitted with the application showing that this application would not cause additional flooding to the neighbors, both in the stormwater management and in the assessment of the floodplain. Additionally, um, uh, it also just spoke to the floodplain in general and not exacerbating that situation. So just keep that in mind as well as if those types of comments come up that we, ha we have gone through lengths to address those in our submission. 
Additionally, we did submit a stormwater management uh, report, which is high level. As was noted, there will be a site plan application associated with this, which does require not impacting any of your neighbors. <laughs> so just keep that in mind as well, because I know it is a concern in this property with warrant. There's flooding issues that occur in the area, but it is a requirement of those detailed designs to make sure there's no impacts. Um, there are, uh, there has been a wetland delineation as well as an environmental impact study demonstrating no impact to the wetland. And that 15 meter buffer from the wetland, uh, you know, it sounds, but keep in mind that that wetland covers the vast majority of the property. So we're well further set back from the, the rest of that wetland. So originally when the mapping was done for the wetland, it showed the wetland far, far, far south. We did a redelineation and are making sure that that boundary is now accurately reflected in the rezoning. So our rezoning application significantly extends what is zoned environmental protection. So we are enhancing the protections from the existing zoning on the site. So again, just want to clarify those differences. Um, and other than that, I'm available after questions. I'm happy to answer any questions from the public, from you as we continue through the public meeting. And, uh, and I appreciate your time. If you have questions for me, just let me know. Thank you, Ms. Saunders. Um, any questions from committee? Councillor Warren. Through you, Mr. Chair, thank you for coming. Absolutely. Um, so, so the wetland, it, it's, it's fairly, it's 15 meters. Back. Yeah, we're 15 meters so, back from the and wetland. it's a provincially significant wetland. So I was just wondering, is there possibility of putting some sort of buffer in? So um, yeah, so the runoff in, can't get to it. Yeah, yeah, so the intent is to have a physical barrier to prevent people from walking into that. So whether it's a fence or landscaping, we'll still have to determine that through detailed design. But there is an obligation and a recommendation in the um, environmental impact study to revegetate that 15 meters. So that will that will also be a buffer to the wetland. Yeah. Any further questions from committee at this time? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you, Ms. Saunders. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak to this application? Anyone from the public wishing to speak to this application? Going to call for a third and final time. Anyone from the public wishing to speak to this application? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Um, this would be your time, Deputy Mayor Richardson. Well, thanks for slowing me down. Um, I, at this time, the report plan 2023-029, Village of Omimi Zoning Bylaw Amendment for uh, 112 King Street West be received for information, and that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment D06-2023-010 be referred back to staff for further processing until technical reviews have been completed and comments have been addressed. Thank you. Okay, is there a seconder for that motion? Member O'Reilly? Um, I just uh, wonder, maybe I'll ask the uh, Jonathan first, and maybe to the mover, if uh, if would it would be appropriate if we could go move this on directly to council. Uh, I think he said uh, they wouldn't have any objection, but maybe for a clarification for me and to the mover, if if that is a friendly. Sure. Yeah, through the chair to uh, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, yes, uh, staff would uh, support that mo that that moving to. Um, to council with bylaw for for approval. Um, just wanted to note that, uh, like I described before, this was the or this is the public meeting, the statutory public meeting. So if um, the planning advisory committee uh, is okay with moving this along, then I, I would have no objection to that. Okay, Deputy Mayor Richardson. Uh, when are you expecting to have those final comments on the technical review? Uh, through the chair, they are all received. Yeah, so the, the outstanding ones were from uh, the Corth Region Conservation Authority and I believe MTO. Um, those said comments have been received and they're, they are okay. Okay, we'll move it, go with friendly. Okay, um, Councillor Warren. I think, I think Member O'Reilly seconded it, so we've, we've got a friendly, so the, the, the motion now is to uh, I'll forward it to council. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Mayor Elmsley? Is the only reason that it was being referred back to staff 
was we were waiting for comments from Kawartha Conservation? That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? If there's none, calling the question, all in favor? That carries, thank you. Item number 3.2 is Plan 2023-30, a revised applications for amendments to the Town of Lindsay official plan and Town of Lindsay zoning bylaw 2000-75 at 77 to 83 William Street North, uh, Lindsay. And uh, Director Hawley was handling this, and I believe are you uh, tackling that today, uh, Leah? I am, Mr. Chair, thank you. Yes, I will step in, and as soon as we get coordinated here with the PowerPoint screen, we'll be well underway. We will be well underway. Thank you. All right, so Muskoka DNM uh, Corp are the owners of this parcel, the applicants, uh, EcoView, uh, Beverly Saunders, with us in person today. Welcome. Uh, an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications are both uh, in front of the committee. The official plan amendment is to address an increase in density. The zoning bylaw amendment is to address site-specific development standards. Uh, both of these amendments would facilitate the redevelopment of the lot for an eight-story, 110-unit residential apartment building at the northwest corner of William and Wellington Streets here in Lindsay. Uh, the location is on the screen before us. We'll just move ahead to the site plan. Uh, the building itself uh, would be structured as follows, a one-story underground parking area. The first story would be at-grade parking, seven stories of apartments above that, an outdoor amenity space on the seventh story, rooftop mechanical equipment uh, above the eighth story, sort of towards the center of the building. Now, staff presented uh, to this Planning Advisory Committee on March 8th a staff report that wasn't a statutory public meeting in accordance with the Planning Act based on how notice was served of that meeting. Uh, it did, though, provide an opportunity to get the public's comments and feedback on the applications at that time. At that time, the proposal uh, was still an eight-story rental building, but with 108 units, so two units less, uh, and slightly more compliant site standards. Uh, the lot at that time was slightly larger. This was before road widenings were requested from the city. So of course that had the effect of reducing the overall lot area and frontage. Now the recommendation uh, from our team today uh, is a refer back uh, to staff for us to continue working through the finalization of the zone compliance matters as a result of this uh, minor redesign. Now pending the outcome of uh, any public comments that we may receive today being a statutory public meeting, um, we have prepared an alternate resolution for your consideration uh, should committee's recommendation be to advance this matter to council. The remaining matters, we feel, can be addressed and mitigated through use of what is commonly known as a holding symbol. It's a Planning Act tool, Section 36 of the Act, and it specifies the future land use once the holding is removed. Um, that happens by subsequent bylaw of council uh, and only can happen once all the items along with that holding provision are satisfactorily met. Now, those items are included uh, on page 12 of your report. Uh, now, way of background, to accommodate the city's request for a three-meter road widening for future improvements, the proposal has been revised to shift the building towards the interior of the lot. It does so uh, and continues to maintain a street-related presence continues to include design features like stepping back around the perimeter. What this does is lessen the massing and shadow impacts on surrounding properties. Now, the approach staff has taken to the report and their evaluation, uh, as you can see, uh, of course, the background, the application details, including a section on public feedback. 
There is a section that details out all of the 14 elements of uh, supporting materials, studies, and plans, uh, as well as summaries from the open house event held by the applicant. Uh, these have been submitted. These have been reviewed. Uh, in some cases, the studies have also been peer reviewed. Those can all be found on page four of the report. The rationale based on conformity to provincial land uses, the growth plan, the provincial policy statements, guidelines, and how this proposal upholds the intent of the local official plan policies and the applicable zoning provisions. A zoning compliance chart identifies where and to what extent relief is needed. Now, to this point, the Lindsay Zoning Bylaw of course, adopted in 2000, over 20 years ago, uh, wasn't written at a time uh, that necessarily envisioned this type of residential intensification and infill redevelopment opportunity. Um, things like addressing market conditions that, of course, different today than they were 20 years ago. Uh, and certainly also this growing housing crisis uh, that we face daily. The report goes on to cover agency consultation and summarizes those comments uh, from our colleagues in ECA development engineering from a critical infrastructure and servicing perspective. Those are found on page 10. Now, pending completion of the city's growth-related studies, that includes growth management strategy, the water wastewater, servicing, capacity master plan update, servicing study. These are matters that are going to impact the future development of this proposed building. Uh, also, the final size necessary for a site triangle needed for safe sight lines. Uh, the comments outlined in the report indicate a 9 by 9 square meter triangle. We do have uh, an indication from our peer reviewer uh, that in fact a 5 by 5 square meter site triangle uh, would be supported. Um, we take this into account together with the potential, of course, for lower traffic speeds given the location of this proposal in town. Uh, we have the opportunity to re-examine a signalized intersection. We also have comments in this section from economic development, uh, from a heritage resources perspective, and finally from the fire department, uh, indicating from uh, their perspective, from a safety perspective, that they have no issues. So overall, Mr. Chair, should the committee refer the matter back to staff, uh, we would continue to review the amending zoning bylaw to cross-reference the relief that's needed with the updated site plan. Uh, however, we also recognize uh, there are certain issues that can't be resolved today. These are issues related to all the growth-related work that the city has undertaken, related to infrastructure, related to servicing. Uh, can also be addressed uh, through the site plan control process, design details, any of those sort of zoning compliance pieces. Um, in this regard, if committee was to move things forward, the H holding provision would capture those items. Again, they're outlined on page 12. I have covered them with the exception of uh, commenting on the need for some potential remediation uh, for some soil contamination, which would also be included as part of the holding provision requirements to be met, as would a site plan control agreement. This is a good news story uh, for the city. Definitely hits some highlights uh, from a planning perspective and merit when considering the city's priorities. Certainly the provision of much needed rental housing, some of which is truly affordable housing through a connection uh, to CMHC funding, provides housing in downtown Lindsay close to services and amenities. In our opinion, Mr. Chair, win-win. So that summarizes our report and our recommendations. Thank you, Leah. Uh, committee, any questions of Ms. Berry at this time? Um, Deputy Mayor Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Uh, Deputy uh, Clerk Watts, can you scroll up on Appendix D? Yep. There should be um, the apartment when, how it's going to be shifted to the back of the lot. There's, in our package, there is, no? It's not on the slides. Okay. Okay, no worries. Um, just a quick question um, through engineering, um, putting that holding symbol on. Is the 5x5 five five a sufficient site uh, triangle size for the intersection? Just kind of looking for opinion. 
I can see my colleague here uh, queuing her mic, so I shall turn things over to our manager, Ed Bellman. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So certainly a nine by nine is the recommendation through the review of the report. We've had discussions with the consultant that has done the peer review as well. And there's still some more uh, work to be done. They have looked at the sight lines with respect to the existing intersection and with some of the proposed numbers as well. But we are looking to confirm prior to agreeing to the five by five at this time. Okay, any further questions of Ms. Berry at this time? Member O'Reilly? Um, I think in the staff report, Lee had touched on it, but I just, uh, the other directors that are here, are, are you confident that the, uh, through the site plan control that uh, we can deal with the issues uh, that were mentioned uh, in the report? Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it is, it's not uncommon to have a holding provision uh, through site plan. Uh, it happens often, uh, and I'm confident with that process, uh, we, we would achieve the city's best interest through that process. Mayor Elmsley. Thank you. Uh, through you to Ms. Barry and I guess Director Rojas, um, the sight line of five meters, um, did I not hear that that was resolved? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, as uh, Christina, uh, Manager Sisson mentioned, uh, it was peer reviewed. Uh, it is uh, a working resolution. Uh, we still have to flesh some of the angles out, uh, but I, I believe in principle, uh, there is a, a potential resolution there. Uh, would you say, for instance, uh, downtown Toronto, would they all have nine meter tr triangles? Through you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'm not sure what the zoning is or the setback is in Toronto, but I, uh, I'm, I'm sure they have zero setback and tight corners. Uh, they also have uh, multimodal forms of transportation. Uh, transit subways of moving around bike lanes. So it's really not fair comparing apples to apples, but in principle, uh, I think there is a solution there. And, and traffic signals can play a large part in that, can they not? Yes, for you, Mr. Chair, absolutely. The one advantage this site does have is it is uh, controlled. The uh, three meter road widening that the proponent has agreed to will greatly aid in that. And there's no question we are uh, improving the existing condition. So that it, there are all, those are all benefits. Thank you. Any further questions from committee at this time? Okay, seeing none, uh, does the applicant owner or agent uh, on behalf of the applicant owner wish to speak to the application? Hello again. Um, my name is Beverly Saunders, just for the record, work for EcoView Consulting. Um, I am the agent for this application. I did provide a presentation because I wasn't sure how far in detail we were going to get in this report. A lot of the details have been covered, so I'll go through it very briefly and then I'll just make myself available for any questions that you have. Um, do you mind switching to the next slide? Thanks. So this is just a little bit about MDM, mostly for the public's um, purposes, because uh, some are not familiar with the developer itself. Um, there were concerns from the public that say they sell the, the building and then it becomes overrun or not a good place to live next to. So we wanted to speak to that very briefly. MDM is a local development company. They've done several developments in city of Kawartha Lakes, are pursuing developments throughout the Ontario area and take their reputation very seriously. So I wanted to give a sense of the types of developments that they do, including one that we've completed already in Fenelon Falls. So this is just a high level of that. I'll switch to the next one. These are some projects that are under development right now. Again, very local, lots happening in the Peterborough and Kawartha Lakes area, as well as in Barrie, Belleville. So just keep in mind that the reputation of this relatively small development company matters in a local context. So I just wanted to make sure that the public is aware of that as well. Um, next slide. These are ones that have happened in the past as well, if they want to go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, next one. 
So this is a comparable rental housing. Now, the big difference between this one here, this is in Barrie, um, versus the one that we're proposing, we do not have uh, balconies proposed for this particular development. There is some intentional design associated with that. But we did want to give a sense of the caliber of units, the type of units that happen, because people think rental housing, affordable housing, and then their minds go in different directions. So we just wanted to give a sense of the quality of the types of units that are used. And that is very unique to this particular market. Um, you know, up until last year, I was a rental, I was also in rental and, uh, you know, the rental market has a very broad range of individuals at this stage. So we wanted to address public comments related to that. Can go to the next slide. This is a brief overview of this particular project. Most of it has already been covered, so I won't get into it too far, but there is some discussions of having affordable, or not discussions, we know that there's going to be affordable as well as rental, and the two will be intertwined with each other, so it's not just one floor is affordable and the rest are rentals, so there'll be a community of rental and affordable housing. Uh, it has been approved for a variety of incentives, and this approval is uh, a big part of getting the approval from CMHC. So that's the reason that we're here today and asking to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. These are some details, which I won't get too far into because most of them have been addressed. So I'll switch to the next one. This is the site location. Um, and again, if there are details requested by the public, I'm happy to go into those as well. It's a lot of technical work that went into the site, so I'm happy to help with that. Site location, and then this is the specifics to those holding provisions. So there was questions about what the holding provisions would entail. So we had asked for um, the traffic assessment to be peer reviewed, so I understand that's ongoing. So we've included that in a holding provision. The site plan agreement. We've talked about a meeting the Ontario Heritage Act. There's some questions about what comments apply and don't, so we've included the, the language in there to make sure we're meeting legislative and policy requirements. The identification of the daylight triangle that's been brought out specifically to make sure that that's addressed at the site plan process and that it comes back forward for approval prior to the completion of the site. And then we have included the, inclu the accommodation of long-term planning for infrastructure and servicing as well as the uh, three meter widening of the road. And then I understand that a, a section was also put in for soils as well. So that's, that's fine with us as, as well. That does, that's not an issue. Uh, next slide. So I again, I won't get into this, but these are essentially the summaries of all of the provisions that we're proposing to change with explanations as to why we believe them to be justified. And I'm happy to go into specifics if there's questions on these. We'll go to the next slide as well. We already covered public comments, which I wasn't sure if that was gonna happen, so I just wanted to make sure I had a slide in case we needed to do that, but I'll go to the next. And then this is just a summary of the justification for moving forward, which I'll very briefly go over. So this is affordable and rental housing, which is desperately needed in Lindsay. There is new and urgent provincial direction for intensification and redevelopment projects to provide housing in Ontario. CMHC funding is contingent upon this project. Uh, getting approved as soon as possible. We are improving conditions, which has been said by all staff, so thank you for that. And, um, and then we went through just, again, the, the planning rationales at the very end. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think that's the last slide there, and if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Ms. Saunders. Uh, committee, any questions at this time? Councillor Warren. Through you, Mr. Chair, thank you again. Um, so, affordable versus rent geared to income. So is we really don't know what affordable is sometimes. So is it mm -hmm. rent geared to income? Uh, do you wanna cover that, Thomas? So it is, rent geared to income, thank you. <laughs> right, and, and so um, the holding symbol is on how many different areas? So the holding symbol just applies to the entire property. The entire, so it's not, that's correct. So it's, I understood it's, there were holding. Um, so there's a number of each. different. Yeah. So it covers all of them. But basically, we have to remove the holding provision, which is a separate application that we have to apply for. Right. So then we provide the evidence as to why it's appropriate to remove it. That comes back forward and then gets approved so by council you have at that to meet time. All that criteria before the whole. Um, it's a discussion with staff. Actually, it might be a better question for staff as to the process of whether you can clear one of those versus all of them have That's to be cleared at once. Yeah, but ones. it's probably better for yeah. staff, so I'll defer to her. 
Thank yeah. you. No problem. Sure, thanks for the question and through the chair. Uh, all provisions uh, noted in the holding have to be met in order for the holding to be removed. Yeah. Okay, any further questions from committee at this time? Okay, seeing none. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak to this application? If you want to come forward to the podium, state your name. Deborah Fletcher, I just wanted to know what CMHC stood for. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to come forward to the podium, please? Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, thank you for this time in your meeting. My name is Glenda Morris. I live at 8 Fair Avenue in Lindsay. Uh, I must say at the outset, I happen to be a member of the city's task force for the development of active transportation, but I am here independent of that, just speaking as Glenda. Um, I speak from the perspective of someone whose main mode of transportation is walking. And I am alert to the conditions that make it either easy or difficult for anyone who might choose to walk rather than drive their car where they need to go. Um, looking at the report, Plan 2023-030, um, noting the recommendation that the plan be referred back to staff to address issues raised through the public consultation process, um, I'd like to now to draw your attention to some concerns with respect to how the proposed building at 77 to 83 William North would make life more challenging and more dangerous for walkers. And in fact, I think unless some changes are made, it would run contrary to the province's provincial growth plan and the city's strategic priorities. So the report submitted by the applicant does discuss and assess the proposal in the context of the provincial policy statement 2020 PPS. There was a traffic impact brief, um, discussion and assessment of the proposal in the context of existing traffic conditions, proposed trip generation, and the impacts on the surrounding road network. Now, with reference to the provincial growth plan, the report does point out that, quote, policies of the growth plan encourage cities and towns to develop as complete communities. And it points out that, quote, the PPS promotes healthy, safe, and livable communities. And there's also reference to the city's four strategic priorities, which are healthy environment, exceptional quality of life, vibrant economy, and good government. And these are all important reminders of the values that apply to all the decisions this committee makes, decisions by staff, and decisions by council. The proposed building, however, runs contrary to these priorities, and this is how I know. I live about 500 meters from the intersection of William and Wellington. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that the conditions there are dangerous and intimidating for pedestrians. To begin with, the traffic lights give priority to cars uh, with a push button required to activate a pedestrian cross signal. Access to that button is obstructed by snow in the winter and it's frequently frozen in place. If the light is green when you press the button, you wait for that green cycle to go through to red, wait through the red cycle, and then look for your walk signal with the new green. If I'm driving my car, I just go on the green. I don't have to get out and push a button. Now, while the program for the lights might be mostly a matter of inconvenience, there's a much more serious um, issue of safety, which results from the absence of any buffer between the pedestrian and the vehicle. And there's really nothing to indicate for the drivers that they're supposed to actually yield to the pedestrians when they make their turn. This intersection happens to have a lot of vehicles that um, are towing. In the winter, they're towing snow removal equipment, and in the summer, they're towing uh, lawn maintenance equipment. And when they make their turn, they are precariously close to the, the uh, pedestrians who are on the sidewalk. So right now, it's a hostile environment for anyone on foot but it's extremely so for people with kids in tow, kids in strollers, people with mobility aids, and anybody even carrying groceries. 
Now, if you continue along the Wellington Bridge, you're on a sidewalk that is really not adequate. It is barely enough room for a stroller. It's too narrow for walkers to pass. And again, it's lacking any buffer between pedestrian and vehicle. Now, cyclists are using the sidewalk, and who can blame them? But it's really just one more hazard for people who are trying to walk on the sidewalk. So, the situation is already bad. And what it will be like with the addition of some 100 vehicles anticipated for residents in a new structure is really nothing short of discouraging from the perspective of the city's str strategic priorities. The first two of those being healthy environment and exceptional quality of life. So you look at the provincial direction to develop as a complete community, and while there are many definitions, a common definition of a complete community is one where walking is encouraged above driving your car. It integrates land use with transportation options, and it recognizes a hierarchy of users of roads based on vulnerability. In other words, when a decision is made, walkers trump drivers. So looking at the suggestion of widening both streets at the intersection by three meters, that's clearly giving the movement of cars priority over the movement of people. And that's a move in the wrong direction. The city has made a commitment to cultivating a healthy environment. That's one where it's easy, safe, and convenient to walk. And think about this. Driving is the most expensive, most hazardous to personal health, and most destructive of the environment. On the other hand, walking is the easiest, cheapest, and most readily available way for everyone to incorporate healthy activity into their daily lives. And it generates zero greenhouse gas. So the biggest risks associated with walking are created by the hazards in the infrastructure and mistakes made by drivers. And they can be mitigated. Can so I get you to wrap up, yeah, Ms. I Morris? Regarding exceptional quality of life, uh, walkers have contributed to a superior quality of life because each individual is healthier and it's a, a very much healthier social climate. Because in your cars, you don't interact with people in the way that you do when you're walking. Walking builds community. So regarding the proposal before you, I urge you to hold out for an alternative use of the property that will contribute to the development of a complete community that will be friendly to pedestrians and will help make walking so attractive, so safe, so convenient that more people will choose to walk instead of driving where they uh, need to go. Thank you for your time and thank you for your work as a, a committee. Thank you, Mrs. Morris. Any questions of the uh, uh, Councilor Warren? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I have a, a question for our Director of Engineering, if I may. Sure. So, um, listening um, to to Ms. Morris um, is uh, Glenda is through this plan and with the extra three meters and and the ing ingress egress and all that is there a way to make that area safer for walkers? Thank you uh, through you Mr. Chair uh, just a point of clarification when when we say a three meter widening it's uh, the three meters for land uh, so that goes towards the right away of the road and within the right away of the road you have the pavement itself, the curbs, the boulevards, the sidewalk, all of that. So the intent for this section is to, uh, in time, get three meter widenings on both sides uh, and then improve all modes of transportation, not just for vehicular. Um, the other note that I want to mention is, yes, this intersection is congested. Uh, it's because we only have one crossing at this location. And the city has plans for a second crossing uh, in this area, which will relieve the congestion. In, uh, again, it's, an, it's a road network. So once we construct the second crossing, or the additional crossing, it should relieve some of these traffic concerns. Councilor Warren. Through you, so going forward with the design, um, to make it more um, walker friendly, that can be um, encapsulated in this 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 whole plan. I just want that on the record. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to speak to the application?
Hello, uh, Pat Murphy is my name. I spoke to you at the last meeting. Uh, thank you for informing me that this one was happening. And um, uh, when I spoke last, um, I wasn't really familiar with the planned development, but was concerned as a neighbor. Um, and I voiced those concerns about uh, the social impacts on the neighborhood and the downtown. Uh, I'm not today going to speak to that, uh, although we still, myself and my neighbors, have that concern. Uh, and we have discussed that uh, we do, in fact, need rental housing. We need low-income housing. We need subsidized housing. We're all in agreement. We also all agree that this is not the right place for that to happen. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit about... Uh, I have been 43 years in the building business and uh, have also more recently been in the development business. And I have a lot of colleagues locally who are in the development business. And uh, hearing a comment earlier from Development Services Director that uh, our official plan is old and maybe things have changed. Well, there's a lot of local developers who are around to see those uh, official plan rules put in place and for many of the local developers they look at their piece of property and they look at the official plan and what all the parameters are and the rules are and when they come in with an application they try to stay within those rules and uh, there's always going to be some minor variances to accommodate the development um, most of the developers that I'm speaking of are longtime citizens. I've been 30 years living here myself, many much longer than myself. And we are always conscious of what is in the best interest of the community. We want to make money, we're in business, but we are community-minded individuals. So I look at this development, and I have now read through extensively on all the paperwork. And the, uh, the minor variances are not minor. They're major variances. Uh, this property was not zoned for or intended to be used for what it's being applied for. And um, in moving this forward, are you sending a message to the rest of us developers that we really don't need to pay any attention to the official plan, that we can make applications to whatever we want on a property and spend a considerable amount of taxpayers' time with municipal employees uh, investigating whether or not they can put that through or not put it through. So the developer that comes in with a simple application that tries to fit within the zoning plan uh, is much more economical to process for the municipality. When you come in and put obstacles in the course of what you're planning and then try to come up with solutions, which I'm hearing our municipal staff are trying to come up with solutions as to how we help this developer put this development through. Uh, and my point that I'm trying to make is you're making a statement to the rest of the developers that follow. Uh, are we planning for the betterment of the entire community? Are we planning for families? Are we planning for pedestrians and cyclists? Are we planning to accommodate our traffic? Uh, and with this application, is this in the best interest of the community? And I'll leave you with that question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, any questions, uh, Committee of Mr. Murphy at this time? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to speak to this application this afternoon? Calling a final time, anyone from the public wishing to speak to the application? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Uh, committee, what would you like to do? Mayor Elmsley? Uh, just a question first. Um, the On page 34, page 12 of 14 on the report, uh, the motion 
that Director Hawley is suggesting, that includes the holding symbols that are listed above? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the member, yes, uh, indeed it does. There is a draft uh, bylaw that has been prepared. Uh, excerpts of it were uh, highlighted in, in fact, on the screen at the moment in the consultant's presentation. The um, one proviso uh, that I'll add, and this is ooh, not numbered anyway, I'm looking through Appendix C of the report package. And under Article 7, holding provision, lists out subsections A, B, C, D, E, and F uh, to include all of the uh, relevant matters. Um, I would, if committee is considering this bylaw, uh, just please draw your attention to item 7C. That reads currently, identification of all measures needed to comply with the Ontario Heritage Act and applicable provincial and local heritage policies for incorporation into the site plan agreement. Uh, we have had uh, an additional request from our uh, EDO, Economic Development Officer for Heritage Planning, um, to include, as a continuation to the sentence, including the submission of a heritage impact assessment. Uh, so that is one uh, new element that I put on the table for the committee's consideration. This is likely new information for the consultants who uh, Mr. Chair may or may not have uh, a further question about that. Um, that's a very long-winded answer to address your question. Yes, there are itemized provisions as noted in the report drafted into the holding symbol in the bylaw. Thank you. Uh, Given that, if I get a seconder, I will move uh, the report as detailed on page 34, continuing on page 35, and including the heritage component. Um, and as I say, if I get a seconder, I'll speak to it. Okay, uh, seconder, Councillor Warren, uh, Mayor Elmsley. Thank you. Um, we desperately need rental housing and we are dealing with a corner of the street that desperately needs some help. Uh, it is, in my opinion, an eyesore as it currently sits. We're looking at a new build that is going to solve several of our problems or help solve several of our problems, including rental housing, including affordable housing, and uh, we need to do this in order for the developer to uh, move forward and secure financing to continue with this project. I think it's a, a very good project. I would disagree with the deputant that it is not the proper place for it. I think it is a very good place for it. And, and certainly it is going to help revitalize that whole section. So, um, my my wish is that we move it uh, forward to council for their consideration and approval. Councillor Warren, through you, Mr. Chair, and and ditto what the mayor has said. Um, I just came from a, a housing and uh, social services committee, and and so um, it's uh, we do need housing in the worst possible way. Um, asking the director of engineering um, how we can make if we can make that area safer for pedestrians and he said yes um, right now it isn't for sure i know i come that way all the time and uh, it's, a, it's a really bad right onto uh, it's william street anyway um, there are many reasons that we sh i think we should move forward with this i have a question of staff though um, uh, with this new addition of uh, uh, the holding provision um, to do with um, heritage um, that the developer didn't know of, will that possibly slow um, down the ability to get his funding? Or zoning? Yeah. So. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Although my inclination is to say no, I would, uh, if we're at that section of the agenda where this is permissible, uh, ask that the consultant speak to that. Um, the language in the 
Article 7C does say identification of all measures needed to comply with the Act. Uh, it's my understanding that as part of those um, measures that an impact assessment would be applicable. Um, but I always like having a firm answer. And again, if, if there's any additional information that can be provided, I, I put that request forward. Um, to, uh, if, and if I may, uh, just one point about the residential use and um, to the member's previous comments. Um, the site it does contemplate through the official plan policies a residential density of uh, uh, quite a high degree, 100 units per hectare. So um, I do want to point that out, that in terms of right place, right time, et cetera, the official plan put in place uh, a number of years ago certainly does contemplate this corner for an increased residential density. Did you want to comment, Ms. Saunders? Okay, so uh, there's some context associated with the heritage impact assessment and the language that we had asked be included in the holding provision was intentional to not include the heritage impact assessment. Um, if policy and law dictates we have to provide one, then we will, but we've already had a heritage expert go to the site and assess the site and we don't believe one is required. But that's a point of contention between us and staff. So we intentionally included language to ensure that we're going to meet applicable policies so that we can continue that conversation in site plan. Um, so we would request that the heritage impact assessment not be included in that language because we don't believe it's actually required, but we are acknowledging that that conversation needs to continue and that it is appropriate to continue that at site plan because those are related to detailed design matters. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything further, Councillor Warren? Mr. Chair, um, so would that um, make it more difficult? To, to get your funding, that's, I guess. An so the funding, no. So if it's at a holding provision point, that's fine. Okay. Um, we the, the, the challenge is just the removal of the holding provision when we get to that stage. At that stage, if it specifically points to a study, becomes much more challenging at the later stages at detail design for us to address that if we're having a difference of opinion as to what is required. That's, that's the only reason I... You. I, th I think we moving forward so quickly is is to help you get your funding. So if that's not going to stop your funding, it will not stop I think the funding. We need to leave it in. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Ms. Saunders. Is there any further uh, discussion? Calling the question. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Uh, Member Barkwell, you're welcome to uh, rejoin us. Okay, at this point, the uh, public meeting being held under the Planning Act is now adjourned, and we will move into item four on today's agenda, deputations. Uh, 4.1 is uh, Donna Campbell. I'll just remind everybody to, uh, when you come up to the mic, you, you have five minutes, and, and we're going to hold everybody to uh, the five minutes out of fairness. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, council members, and many neighbors and guests. My name is Donna Campbell, and I have lived at Richard Avenue for the last 17 years. After many discussions with our ward councillor, Eric Smeaton, felt that I must speak on behalf of my family, including my 91-year-old mother, who lives at the very end of Richard Avenue, as well as for the many senior and working neighbors who could not be here today due to mobility issues and work commitments. Eric encouraged all of us to add our voices because your decisions directly impact our homes and way of life. To address some of the city's issues concerning the extensions, number one, if EMS and police response time is a concern, 
These services would take the more direct routes offered by St. Joseph Road and Connolly to access Tribute South, not travel through our circular streets with a stop sign on every block. Does the city have a report from the police and the EMS that supports connecting David and Richard? Number two, if multiple exits from a community are key, why does Tribute North, the larger of the developments, have only four, and Tribute South, the smaller one, need eight? Additionally, why is there only one exit onto Thunderbridge Road from the north? Looking at the Cove Fisher survey by Tribute, provided to a few of the homeowners, plan number 374, dated 2022. It clearly shows <clears throat> a one foot strip of reserved registered land running across both the ends of David and Richard Avenues. Historically, these reserves were put in by the original landowners with the purpose of preventing further connecting roads. Also, the placement of fire hydrants at the end of these roads 50 years ago are located well into the roads and would have to be moved. City of Kawartha Lake stated in their staff report that the existing roadway dead ends indicate <clears throat> there has always been intention to extend these roads further west. That may have been the city's intention but the reserved land and the placement of fire hydrants indicate otherwise. Additionally, when these dead end roads were put in 50 years ago, the perceived connections would have been to a similar neighborhood with moderate size homes, large lots, and low density. Such a connection would have had minimal impact and minimal increase in traffic. However, the proposed 1,000 plus residential units will have a significantly larger impact. Also, when they put in Richard and David in the 60s, they would have not anticipated that there would be two newer, larger, parallel roads only a few hundred meters away. These roads were designed to handle large volumes of traffic. Why does the city need two roads in a residential area to have connections if they are only a few hundred feet apart. To all of us here, this seems excessive and unnecessary. To speak to the loop services, which I take to mean water, sewers, and hydro, why would the city want to hook up to 50-year-old infrastructure in our neighborhood when St. Joseph and Connolly Road, a block away, offer new, up-to-date services. We have been told the costs would be minimal. Is this because the city will leave tar-based roads as is and hope they stand up to heavy traffic? Is Tribute, who have shown they don't need the connections, going to foot the bill to rip up our streets to bring them up to code? Or is it to make a quick connection now and leave taxpayers to deal with the aftermath if the streets don't hold up, resulting in higher taxes for major road construction? If the city is looking to improve traffic flow in response time, money would be better spent on widening Angeline and Colburn streets which are already congested. Another bridge across the river would provide better flow east and west and divert traffic from the downtown. Turning two of our little streets into access roads will not improve traffic flow or response time. What it will do is adversely impact a 60-year-old heritage area. Can I get you to conclude, Ms. Campbell? Sure. Your five minutes is uh, up. Okay, I'm, I'm just about there. New developments should enhance existing neighborhoods, not ruin them. This city, 
if it should matter a great deal to the city that homeowners and taxpayers, many lifetime residents, feel these extensions are excessive and unnecessary. This is not a case of not in our backyard, because you are in our backyards for four long years with the Bromont construction, and now you want our front yards as well to put in roadways that we can all do without. If Tribute and the prior developer, Orsi, in 2011 can design and build their subdivisions without extending David and Richard, why can't the city? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Can I have a motion to receive the deputation? Uh, Member O'Reilly, seconded by uh, Mayor Elmsley. Uh, any questions or discussion? It's none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, 4.2, uh, Joe McCall and Ross Kanye. And I apologize if I pronounce anybody's names incorrectly. That's okay, I'm used to it. I'm Ross Conyer, I live at uh, 21 Linwood Road. And I just wanted to speak on, mostly on behalf of my neighbors who couldn't be here, uh, about some of their concerns about the proposal. Uh, we understand that urban planning uh, doctrine dictates you know, to have as many entrances and exits as possible uh, to any given development. But there reaches a point where there's too many. You could build a subdivision with every house in it having two road frontages, even three or four road frontages. But we all know this reaches a point of absurdity. So you have to look at what is reasonable. Let reason and common sense dictate a sufficient number of entrances and exits. And I just want to uh, mention too, I know you have a copy of the uh, 2011 uh, consultant report from Michael Smith, uh, was sent to Richard Hawley at the city too, uh, and they were not in support of opening up the roads uh, in question at that time. And also too, I have spoken to uh, Several EMS workers, including 911 dispatcher, paramedic, uh, police officer, and uh, fire person. And now uh, the, these people all are in agreement that if they were responding to an emergency in this proposed subdivision, that if there were access roads in our neighborhood, that would be the least desirable route as it would actually impede their response time instead of improving it. And so I just want you to bear that in mind. And also too, when these roads were designed, I believe it was back in the late 50s, that uh, these curves and bends and hairpin turns, three-way intersections, these roads were not designed for thoroughfares. They were simply a rural residential uh, community that was built to the standards of Ops Township, which that was a part of at that time. And just to make mention too of the one foot reserve at the end of the road, uh, that was in the, the name of the original owner of the farm there that these properties were built on, the sleeps. And there's only one purpose to have a one-foot reserve, and, and that is to prevent uh, an unnecessary road connection or road access. Now, I want you to, to also consider the, the costs. Uh, if these road entrance or road connections were allowed to happen, uh, as a realtor in this community for over 25 years, I can tell you right now, there would be a significant loss of value and subsequently the tax base in the homes in this area. Uh, because anytime I sold a home in that community, the number one uh, attribute that you could, uh, or characteristic of the home that attracts buyers is the fact that it's a cul-de-sac enclave type of neighborhood. And, uh, you know, when, when people drive through there, they actually slow down, stop and take a look and actually ask people on the street if there's any homes coming up for sale. This is a very desirable gem of a neighborhood, which this community has far too few of. 
Uh, and I'd like to mention uh, areas like Henry Park, Willow Glen, uh, Sweetenham and Cook Street, which is a newer division or subdivision. And that only has one entrance in and out. And so I just want you to bear that in mind. Your, your five minutes is almost up, Mr. Kanye, okay. and if Mr. McCall has anything to say, it's a combined five minutes for the two of you. Okay, and the final one I want to touch on is that the, there's at least 20 children in the neighborhood, a lot of seniors, and converting it from local traffic to actually through traffic to a major artery is going to be a very significant safety issue. Thank you for your time. Joe? Would you wish that I wait till the end it, it's a combined five minutes mr. McCall so you're 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 you're, you're replacing somebody as it is so you got about one minute to get your point across well it's short I don't know if it's a minute okay good afternoon my name is Joe McCall resident of 22 24 Richard Avenue I wasn't aware that I would be able to speak but anyway bear with me please Anyway, I am frustrated, as a lot of people in our community are, to have to do this go around again after 2011, having done the same thing. Um, here we have two developers, Orsi and Tribute, who after their planning and consultation concluded the connections were not needed or beneficial. Uh, we have, we would have, or this would occur, 26-foot roads from the new tribute development feeding to 20 to 21-foot roads on Richard Linwood uh, Hopkins, not Hopkins, Hopkins has been right. No sidewalks with children walking to Angeline for the bus, old folks on their scooters and walkers, people walking to their with their dogs, etc., walking it, uh, alone, and a lot of children playing on it because we have no sidewalks. A lot of traffic would put this at risk, safety otherwise. There are 50 houses, approximately 50 houses in this neighborhood, and I would assure you, 45 of them do not want these connections. And does this not count? Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Did I make the minute? Yeah. Pretty close, I'll give you that. <laughs> um, committee, can I get a motion to receive the deputation? Uh, Member Barkwell, seconder, Mayor Elmsley, any questions or discussion? Uh, Member O'Reilly, all in favor? That carries, thank you. Uh, 4.3, Paul Hill. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Elmsley, council members, and guests. <clears throat> My name is Paul Hill. I'm a citizen of Richard Avenue and a retired English teacher. Isn't it odd how historic drama often parallels real life? Wolfgang von Goethe's play Faust somewhat reflects our present circumstances. Quote, he who strives on and lives to strive can earn redemption still. <clears throat> Our small enclave off of David Drive, Hopkins and Linwood Roads, and Richard Avenue are striving for redemption as well. Since when do the wishes of council supersede the residents that they are supposed to represent? 99% of our neighbors signed this petition opposing proposed thoroughfare extensions. As you can see, it is extensive. In addition, two reports from planning consultants have indicated that expansion is unnecessary, unreasonable, and a needless expense. Here are the thoughts of one of our residents of 29 years, Cindy Baldry. She spent months <clears throat> looking for a home in Lindsay and decided upon this subdivision due to its park-like setting. Two reasons appeal to her, minimal local traffic and safety to children riding their bikes or elderly citizens seeking a pleasant walk. There have been numerous changes, including subdivisions and the end of the natural habitat of coyotes and other creatures. 
I'm quoting Cindy here. The planning department feels emergency medical service will be affected. After 32 years of policing, I confidently say response times would not change for the better. EMS is not responding to a remote rural location single access route. Connolly and Sylvester have already been slated to be extended. 300 feet separate Connolly and Richard as well as David Drive and St. Joseph which accesses Sylvester. Traffic on Angeline and Colburn has increased significantly with Springdale Gardens subdivision. Please abandon your planned extensions and leave things as they are and as we were initially told would remain. <clears throat> Our area has already put up with construction, dirt, noise, pollution, and the knocking down of irreplaceable trees of environmental importance regardless of any notice <clears throat> to new or long-term existing occupants. We have over 65 signatures from the majority of residents in our neighborhood. As I visited, only a few were aware of today's meeting. A little over a week is not enough time for people to rearrange their times and attend today. Better communication in a timely manner would be appreciated when significant decisions are being made that will impact our homes. An evening meeting would be preferable to allow more constituent participation. You may notice that the gallery is filled with our concerned neighbors who could attend. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Can I get a motion to uh, receive the deputation? Member O'Reilly, seconded by Councillor Warren. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Do you need this in the petition? No, we've got that on the record. Thank you. Uh, 4.4, 4, Emma and Carl Eakin. Thank you for pronouncing our names right. <laughs> Good afternoon, council members and guests. I would like to take a moment to introduce myself and my husband. My name is Emma Eakin, and this is my husband, Carl. It's been a minute since I've done this. Carl and I were born and raised in the GTA where we raised our family and where we each worked for over 40 years, spending weekends and vacations in the courses. We have strived to practice a, long, a strong moral code and a deep commitment to our family, community, and the environment. Carl and I both worked for large financial institutions where we further developed our commitment to acting with respect for governance, individuals, and community. Carl has been coming up to the Kawarthas since he was an infant. I have been coming up since my teens and my children and grand grandchild. have been coming up since they were infants. We love the Kawarthas and choose to live and chose to live in Lindsay, which would allow us to enjoy the beauty here and still be relatively close to our children and grandchild, allowing them to visit and to continue to enjoy all the Kawarthas has to offer. We chose the location in the ravines of Lindsay because based on our proximity to green spaces and services, we are invested emotionally and financially. We knew that we would need to be respectful of our proximity to Jennings Creek. This included a swale of two meters at the rear of our backyard. We expected this. What we did not expect was a seven foot wide trench filled with large rocks the size of my fist. It was our understanding that this trench was to remain uncovered, exposing adults, teenagers, children, seniors, and pets to the risk of serious harm. However, this risk, I'm very happy to say, has been mitigated just starting yesterday. The trench is now being filled with soil and we hope will be covered with sod. For this, we are grateful. Secondly, there are a number of trees along the property lines that border our home as well as a number of our neighbors that require immediate attention. There are several dead or dying trees and a significant number of large branches extending over the fence and into backyards. These dead or dying trees and large overhanging branches also present a risk to the well-being of people and pets. 
especially when you consider that significant weather events with strong winds are increasing in frequency and intensity. We decided to be proactive and reached out to Tribute Homes. Tribute was very responsive. Within a matter of days, Carl and I met with Tatiana DiGiancento, Project Manager, Site Servicing Tribute Communities. Tribute agreed to review the matter with the appropriate oversight bodies to address these concerns on a priority basis. Work is underway for our property. While we deeply appreciate this timely response and Tribute's efforts, I believe that this courtesy should be extended to all property owners that share a border with Tribute and urge them to do so on a priority basis. Living on Connolly Road, I feel compelled to mention that there's been a lot of you know, people are alluding to send everybody up Connolly, send everybody up Connolly. And while I respect the other guests here and their concerns, I can't comment on the validity. I have, don't have that expertise, but I certainly understand that change is hard. But I want to mention that there's 147 homes in the ravines of Lindsay, of which I am one. We have seniors, we have children, we have pets, and we want to live with the existing residents in a peaceful manner. <laughs> but please, please be cautious about redirecting the northern part of that southern development up through Connolly, because that will impact our quality of life as well. I would like to thank and acknowledge Richard Hawley from Tribute Homes, Tatiana DiGenincinto from Tribute, and Kirk Timms from City of Kortha Lakes for their support in responding to our inquiries in a supportive and timely manner. Thank you, Council, for, your, for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, committee. Can I get a motion to receive the deputation? Deputy Mayor Richardson, Mayor Elmsley, any questions or comments, committee? Uh, all in favor? Thank you, Ms. Eakin. That brings us to 4.5, Michael Testaguza and Jeff Soley. Thank you very much, um, Chair, and uh, well done with the name. <laughs> um, thank you for hearing me today. My name is Michael Testaguza from the Big Lee Area Group, planning consultant for Tribute Communities, who are the applicants for items 6.1 and 6.2. With me, I do have Jeff Solly and Paul Watson as well from Tribute Communities. Uh, we want to firstly start off by thanking staff for all the hard work on this application. Um, putting together the staff report, putting together the implementing documents that you have before you. I printed them this afternoon. There was about 160 pages. A lot of work went into it. So uh, thank you very much to staff. Um, also like to thank the residents. As you've heard, taking time from their schedules to come here and uh, in numerous other um, venues, which we've had these meetings before, to provide their commentary to yourselves. Uh, at this point today, we just wanted to be here uh, to answer any questions that um, the committee may have uh, and make ourselves available. We don't have any further commentary. As I said, there's been 162 pages written about these two applications, so I don't want to go into it in uh, any greater detail, but happy to answer any uh, specific questions of the committee. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Testaguza. Committee, could I get a um, motion to receive the deputation? Deputy Mayor Richardson, Member O'Reilly. Is there any uh, questions or comments of the deputant at this time? Member O'Reilly. Thank you, uh, through, through to Michael today. Uh, you've seen the staff report, uh, and you've seen the options of the road, and you've seen this being peer reviewed. Um, do you have any comment on that? Uh, certainly. So we have prepared um, implementing documents and plans that can accommodate either um, either option. We've designed the plan in such a way that at this point it's malleable and um, to an extent uh, in the committee's hands with respect to the direction it goes. So we've designed it in a way um, that's flexible is what I should say at this point. Uh, and we're in your hands in that regard. Uh, Member Barkwell. Uh, just to follow up on that, so uh, one of the comments was uh, 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 from uh, 
uh, Miss Aiken, Egan, sorry, <laughs> uh, about uh, if you if you don't use the access through Richard, then uh, your alternative would be to go through Connor. And is that going to create a, a, a major problem, or is is it kind of a, a fairness and a, a and a, a, a wise thing to have two accesses rather than uh, just to divert? Uh, no, a uh, perfectly fair question. I understand the point. Um, so there's a couple of connections to the east and south here. Uh, so there is Connolly in the northeast. Uh, so if you're looking at the map there on uh, Tribute South, I wish I wore my glasses. Um, uh, the northeast is the connection to Connolly, which is the ravines of Lindsay, uh, the Bromont application. Heard it referenced a couple of different ways there. Um, and then there's also obviously just south of that, two potential connections that we're discussing at David and Richard. Um, further south, a connection to Sylvester. And then again, further south, um, a connection to, oh, Jeff, help me. Saint, is it directly to St. Joseph? Directly to St. Joseph. Um, a southward extension to the craft lands to the south, and then extension to uh, Highway 7 to the west, um, 35 to the west. So there are several points of uh, egress and entrance uh, into that southern community, certainly. So I think that if, if that provides some context, there's more than just um, Connolly to go east. Um, and there are north, south, and west kind of routes out of that community as well. So there's a, a wealth of options in either scenario. Okay. Any further questions, uh, Member O'Reilly? Everybody else, that. Anyways, through to you, Mike. Um, which, um, what, what are your phases, and when do you, uh, when you're talking about north versus south, and I see the model homes are going, uh, going up. Uh, what's your uh, plan of development and time frame? Certainly. Uh, so the phasing plan actually uh, was just popped up on the screen, so thank you for that. So different phasing plans for the north and the south. Um, in essence, uh, the southern is starting at the southeast corner, um, moving up to, oh my God, I can barely read it. <laughs> I have it written down here. So, sorry, <laughs> it's moving west, right? I did draw them out the other day for you. So, um, uh, starting at the southeast corner, moving to the southwest, and then uh, moving in the northeast and again to the west. So we're starting in essence on Tribute South in the southern portion of the property, east to west, moving over to the north and going east to west. In Tribute North, we're starting in the southeast corner again, moving to the northeast corner, and then we're moving to the western side of the property, so starting at the southwest and moving up. Any further questions from committee? Uh, Mayor Elmsley? Thank you. Do you have do you have any time frames on that on the length of time it will take? And Jeff, I may defer that to you. If you can just use the mic, Jeff. Sorry. The online people. Thank you very much. We do know that South uh, Phase One. Uh, we want to proceed right away with with our uh, earthworks and servicing. We're anticipating that if all goes well, we'll do earthworks this year, roads and sewers next year with house construction starting at the end of the year and first occupancies following that. So what's it, 23, 24? So first occupancies in 2025. Depending on the market, we will then proceed from phase to phase to phase. So uh, beyond phase one, I really can't um, give you much more of an idea, but. If you were, if we were to go forward, when would the access to Richard be required? If it were required, physically, the the phase three south lands, um, you know, could be five or six years away, roughly speaking. You know, again, depending on because we have quite a few houses that we want to you know, absorb and, and, and build and so on and so forth. Again, depending on the market, the economy, and so on and so forth, that could go very quickly or could drag out over a period of time. But order of magnitude, hopefully that helps. Thank you. 
Any further questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Testacusa. Okay, that brings us to item five, correspondence. And if I can have a motion to uh, receive the correspondence from K. Dibero, uh J. Kilborn, D. Pierce, G. Welton, D. Campbell, A. Mena, and V. Curtin. Mayor Elmsley, seconder, Deputy Mayor Richardson. Any discussion? Calling the question, all in favor? That carries, thank you. Uh, that brings us into uh, item 5.2, um, correspondence. Okay, so sorry, we've got some late correspondence. 5.2 uh, received from Dee McGriskin. Can we get a, a motion to receive that? Uh, Member O'Reilly, seconder. Uh, Member Barkwell, any discussion? Calling the question, all in favor? That carries, thank you. Item uh, six, regular and returned reports. Item 6.1, uh, plan 2023-027, the application to amend the OPS and Lindsay official plans and respective zoning bylaws 93-30 and 2000-75 together with a draft plan of subdivision at 460 Thunderbridge Road. Uh, Lindsay, tribute to Lindsay uh, Norsight. Um, do you have anything to comment, uh, Manager Barry? Mr. Chair, I have prepared uh, in just a summary of the comprehensive, uh, comprehensive lengthy report uh, that staff have prepared um, for the benefit of uh, the members. I wouldn't mind touching on a few highlights if time permits. Uh, we have, I think, been familiarized with the site. We are focusing on the sort of north, uh, well, as defined, tribute north that's on the screen at the moment. Uh, and a bit more detail on the north plan here. Uh, so to recap, uh, this is a proposal to facilitate an urban mixed-use residential commercial plan of subdivision on full municipal services across about 126.2 hectares on the east side of Highway 35, south of Thunderbridge Road, west of Angeline Street North, generally north of Jennings Creek. This would be the northwest quadrant of Lindsay. Uh, we are looking at a subdivision uh, to contain about 1,832 residential units. This is uh, comprised of low-rise singles, semis, towns, uh, and affordability option through ARUs, additional residential units. Um, commercial block and institutional block to potentially support an elementary school. Of course, stormwater management blocks, parks and open space, natural corridors, a compensation area for wetland removal and environmental protection blocks, municipal infrastructure, potentially a water tower, road widenings, road reserves. Now access to Thunderbridge Road uh, would be one point of access, two points of access to Angeline Street North, a future bridge connection over Jennings Creek to the property to the south. We will get to that in a couple of moments here. A uh, total of 32 new municipal streets, two of which would be collectors. Now, uh, to facilitate the draft plan of subdivision is an official plan amendment request and an amendment to the zoning bylaw request. The official plan amendment would reconfigure and redesignate the land use, moving uh, land uses from the designations in the city's official plan into the town of Lindsay official plan. Uh, in effect, uh, this would uh, put a single uh, planning instrument coverage area over this parcel. The details of the official plan amendment uh, is in Appendix C as well as pages five to six of the report. Uh, I will note that importantly, uh, the amendments contemplated here are in alignment with the ongoing parallel effort to resolve outstanding appeals of the Lindsay Secondary Plan at the Ontario Land Tribunal. Uh, we of course wouldn't support any other approach. Uh, with respect to the zoning, uh, of course, to address site-specific development standards to facilitate this plan. The details of that you'll find on Appendix D and pages 6 to 7 of the report. Now, the statutory public meeting required under the Planning Act was held last summer, July 6, 2022, where the overall tribute community plan uh, was described in much detail, where public feedback was given, and where committee referred the matter back to staff. Keep that plan there just for another minute. 
Public feedback is summarized and addressed on pages 18 to 19 of the report. Now, further to the motion of the committee at that time, we're back at this regular meeting to advance the applications today. To that end, we've prepared amendments to the planning instruments that govern land uses at this location. So that's two official plans and two separate zoning bylaws, as well as the conditions of approval, all 120 of them. These documents are appended uh, to the report. Now, this body of work is the result of many, many coordinating meetings between the tribute team and city staff since the statutory public meeting and in fact for some time prior. Uh, so much discussion and issue resolution has taken place. Draft approval applies to the entire development. Uh, it is divided into five phases. And those of course are labeled with N1 through N5. The exact lotting will be determined through the registration of the M plan, that's the registered plan of subdivision, with each phase of development. Now the approach uh, to the report and the uh, final evaluation um, goes on to summarize how the issues have been addressed. You'll find that through pages seven to 11. These pertain to noise, to traffic, to engineering, and to planning matters, as well as First Nations consultation. Uh, that being sort of a chronology of the engagement activities to date. Uh, with respect to noise, the consulting firm YCA determined that sound levels are acceptable uh, under the ministry's guidelines. Um, noise abatement measures would be secured through the conditions of draft approval. Road widenings for provincial and city roads and further refinement through, of course, the detailed engineering design process address traffic issues. Uh, with respect to engineering comments, the unit counts are in alignment with allocations granted in the Northwest Trunk Sanitary Sewer. Implementation of a registration tracking document prepared by the developer to track the registration of units on a phase-by-phase -phase basis over time would be required as a condition. And here is an idea of what that would look like. Or potentially not. We'll just give that a minute to catch up and we'll see if we fly ahead. Uh, but that uh, represents the tracking chart. Matters related to a future municipal water infrastructure block, timing, design, and construction of the creek crossing, the conveyance of lands with respect to the OPS number one municipal drain, and of course matters related to runway reorientation. Uh, planning issues, those being uh, incorporation of the active transportation elements, urban design, parkland, a multi-purpose path system. These are all issues that have been discussed and addressed. The staff report goes on, of course, with an evaluation of application merits through the lens of provincial policy, the growth plan, the provincial policy statement, our own city official plan, uh, other planning instruments, of course, the bylaw provisions. The staff report summarizes agency comments, pages 19 to 21, from our colleagues in ECA Development Engineering and Human Services Departments, Curve Lake, First Nations, Health Unit, Ministry of Transportation, Kawartha Conservation, and the utility companies, Enbridge, Canada Post, Nexacom, Hydro One. The conditions of approval address agency comments. They're reflective of the fact that no agency objects to the approval of the amendments or the draft plan. We can now report out, Mr. Chair, that in consideration of the comments, the issues contained in the report that staff recommends approval of the amendments and the draft plan with the conditions appended to the staff report, and that the committee refer the matter to council for a final decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Elmsley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to uh, Ms. Barry. Uh, we're dealing with Tribute North here. That has nothing to do with the uh, issue of Richard and David Street. Is that correct? Thank you. I agree with the chair. Okay, Member O'Reilly. Are you ready for a motion? If you are. <laughs> um, on Tribute North, the report, uh, I uh, moved the motion to receive the report and to move the recommendation. The report plan 2023-027 Tribute North proposed mixed use residential, commercial and institutional plan of subdivision for 1,832 residential units. Uh, uh, application D12020 D0 be received in the bylaws to implement the proposed official plan amendment substantially in the form attached to appendix C to report plan 2023-027 be referred to council for adoption. 
Okay, and that the zoning bylaw amendment yep. substantially in the form attached as Appendix D to Report Plan 2023-027 be referred to Council for approval and adoption, that the draft plan of subdivision 16T-20501 is shown on Appendix E, and the conditions of draft plan approval substantially in the form attached as Appendix F to Report Plan 2023-027 be referred to Council for approval and adoption, that in accordance with Section 3417 of the Planning Act, Council having considered the changes to the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendments and deemed no further public notice to be necessary that upon the council approval date staff be authorized to issue approvals to allow the applicant to commence with site alteration works and that mayor and council be authorized to execute any documents required by the approval of these applications. Seconder, please. Mayor <laughs> Elmsley, any discussion? Calling the question. All in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. That brings us to item 6.2, plan 2023-028, applications to amend the Lindsay official plan and zoning bylaw 2000-75 together with a draft plan of subdivision at vacant land on Highway 35, uh, Lindsay Tribute uh, South. Uh, Ms. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, now, much Good like the here. Tribute North proposal, the uh, Tribute now South proposal on the screen uh, would facilitate, again, an urban mixed-use residential commercial institutional plan of subdivision uh, on full municipal services and on a slightly larger holding, 73.57 hectares, uh, just south of the north parcel uh, just discussed directly north of the Sugarwood subdivision. So in this case, uh, up to 1,111 residential units, again, low-rise singles, semis, towns, and a block for condo towns, condominium towns. Additional residential units, of course, being an option to support housing affordability through rental tenure. Two commercial blocks in uh, the Tribute South community. Again, an institutional block, potentially an elementary school, stormwater management facilities, parks and open space, natural corridors, a couple of environmental protection blocks. Uh, in this case, with respect to municipal infrastructure and uh, road widenings, 16 new municipal streets, two of which would be collectors, the extensions of two existing streets. Uh, in more detail, points of access, the extension of Sylvester Drive west out to Highway 35, McKay Avenue south through the site north via a bridge connection over the Jennings Creek to the property to the north, Connolly Road in the northeast corner, uh, and a connection to St. Joseph Street. Now, Richard and David. Staff uh, also support the additional vehicular connex, Richard Avenue, David Drive to the east. The existing roads dead end. This indicates there has always been an intention to extend these roads. The extensions would go further west into the subject lands. Now, doing so in our estimation provides for great local connectivity, not only for area residents, uh, for vehicles, certainly to provide more pedestrian options as well. We feel emergency services can also access the neighborhood more readily. That's not to say that it would prohibit activities otherwise. Underground servicing can be looped in the vicinity. According to our engineering staff, an extension of Richard addresses and improves upon the existing road configuration, which currently terminates without a standard turning basin, in other words, a cul-de-sac. The issue has been very contentious from surrounding residents, neighbors, as certainly we've heard today, as is evidenced also through the written correspondence we've received. Staff maintain the road network was originally determined through a substantial and rigorous planning and engineering exercise, through council decisions, to be set up for the extensions that are proposed in this application. This has been anticipated for several decades. The traffic issue has been peer reviewed. It is supported as the go forward option from the professionals reviewing this plan. It's been substantiated by good planning principles for an overall complete community design. Now turning to the specifics of the applications, the official plan amendment uh, and the zoning bylaw amendment in the Tribute South communities uh, only need to address two planning instruments, the Town of Lindsay official plan and Town of Lindsay zoning bylaw. 
Uh, details of those are, of course, found in your staff reports, appendices C and D, pages six to seven. Uh, like with the North Tribute community, the statutory public meeting was also held same day, July 6, 2022. The public comments uh, received and addressed, uh, you'll find on pages 19 to 20 of the staff report. Of course, we've prepared the amending documents uh, and the draft conditions of approval, in this case, 119, one fewer, uh, slightly smaller land base. The documents are appended to the staff report. Uh, again, uh, as was the case with the Tribute North community, uh, this is an application review exercise that has been in the works for a number of years, has been thorough, has involved uh, outreach, feedback to stakeholders and to members of the community. The draft approval applies to the entire development, uh, in this case divided into four phases, uh, S1 through S4, labeled on the plan. And as with the Tribute North uh, community, the exact lotting would be determined through registration of the M plans with each phase of the development. The approach to the staff report is identical to the Tribute North community uh, with respect to evaluation of noise, traffic, engineering, planning, and First Nations consultation, indicating how all of the issues have been addressed. There, of course, uh, goes on to be a evaluation of the relevant provincial planning policies, growth plan and the provincial policy statement, as well as the city's own planning instruments. Agency comments are summarized. The conditions of approval address the agency comments. They're also reflective of the fact that no agency objects to the approval of the amendments to the official plan, zoning bylaw, or the draft planning conditions. So Mr. Chair, again, we do report out that in consideration of the comments, the issues that are contained in the report that we've discussed today, uh, we are putting forward recommendations to approve the amendments, the official plan, to the zoning bylaw, to the draft plan, the conditions that are attached, and ask that the committee refer this matter to council for final approval. Thank you. Okay, committee, questions, comments, directions, Mayor Elmsley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to, hmm, I guess we'll see. Um, this, this connection, Richard and David, has been on the books for some 40 years or more. Is that correct? If I may, I uh, shall defer to our Director of Engineering, Corporate Assets, please. Thank you. Uh, through you, um, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm not sure of the time frame. Uh, as some of the residents mentioned, this, this uh, subdivision, uh, Richard, Linwood, Hopkins, and David, is quite old, uh, no question. Uh, it was most likely uh, draft plan approved and occupied probably in the 70s, 60s, uh, we could look at that. But it's been quite a uh, long time. Uh, at that point in time, it was always envisioned that Richard and David go, would go through. Um, now, the de one of the deputies did mention, uh, and it's a fair point, that in the, assuming it's in the 70s, the densities were by far a lot different. The minimum lot sizes have changed over the last 50, 60 years. So there is no question that uh, when it was uh, complicated to go through to a, the Jameson subdivision, they would have had in mind similar densities. Absolutely. Uh, however, uh, Richard Avenue and David are being proposed to connect to other local roads. So in Tribute South, you see those roads uh, that are the extension of David and Richard as local roads. They're not being proposed to connect to major arterials, county roads, they are local roads that are connecting to, and then your major collector, as uh, uh, has been stated, is the north-south. The north-south, was it, which is the extension of McKay, uh, which is being brought up through the Craftlands. Uh, that's your major north-south. So that's sort of one point of clarification. And if I might add another um, comment, that uh, the issue of two connections for EMS has been brought up. Uh, and it's not the fact that Tribute South needs two connections. Tribute South is well connected within their own subdivisions to multiple points. They have no issues. 
it's the existing subdivision. So for example, if there was a road closure at David and Angeline, uh, for whatever reason, and that road was blocked off, there would be no other way to get to that community. Uh, so fortunately, we haven't had that issue in the last 60 years. There hasn't been both an emergency required at the end of Richard with the uh, road closure at David and Angeline. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean it can't happen in the future. And that's what we protect for. We protect for any uh, neighborhood that have multiple points of entrance and exit. Uh, and sort of that's the rationale behind it. Um, thank you. Follow up. Um, so it is, we, have we already collected the funding through DCs or others for the costing for this connection? So there's, through you, Mr. Chair, so I think there's two questions there. So the developer of tri uh, Tribute would be develop, would be responsible for any local connections uh, within their ownership of land. Uh, outside of Tribute, so external to Tribute Holdings, I, again, the existing Richard, David, Linwood and Hopkins would be a city project. Uh, so that would be our responsibility, just like any other road when we, when it's at the end of life, we reconstruct. Uh, and there are several examples in Lindsay. Um, a few come to mind. Logie Street, uh, Park Side, uh, Park Side Drive, in that area of town, that were originally constructed to a rural standard. Uh, so no sidewalk stitches, tar and chip, similar to the roads in Richard and, and David. Uh, and through the course of uh, urbanizing or reconstructing the road, the city, through our roads program, would reconstruct it to a urban standard. We recognize that in the 60s and the 70s when it was constructed, it was a different uh, time, <laughs> right? The roads looked differently, uh, but we reconstruct. Uh, Mayor Elmsley, you brought the point of Toronto uh, in the previous discussion. Uh, again, um, when roads are, are reconstructed, we reconstruct them to the standard of the day, right? Acknowledging that we've inherited roads in the past and the land use has changed uh, through our asset management plan, through life cycle, we would reconstruct the roads to today's standard independent of if there was a development adjacent to it. So if Tribute South never existed, that road would eventually come to end of life and we would reconstruct the road to an urban standard. So it should be really thought of independently of the adjacent developer. And that would include sidewalks? Through you, Mr. Chair, correct. So if, if this were to happen and that connection were made, it's not in the five-year roads plan currently. It would have to come into the five-year roads plan, which would presumably either increase the, the budget for roads or it would replace something that's currently in the five-year roads plan. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair. So a couple comments, uh, yes and no. So I, let me try to explain it. So the, uh, so first, the, the roads need study in the five-year road plan, you're absolutely right, doesn't uh, identify Richard David Hopkins or Linwood because those roads are in relatively good shape for the most part. Um, through development, uh, you could see increase in traffic, but again, even if you put the development aside, in time they would come to a disrepair and we would have to reconstruct it. Could that disrepair be accelerated with the Tribute South development? Possibly. Uh, so if they, if they were, we would then accelerate the reconstruction of those roads, subject to council approval and other priorities. Now, having said that, those roads would be funded by the general tax levy. But you have to keep in mind, as Ms. Barry, or Manager Barry has mentioned, I believe there's over a, th a thousand units or so uh, in the Tribute South development. So that means an additional tax revenue of a thousand people. So yes, you're spending more money, but on the other side of the ledger, you're collecting more tax revenue. So in my opinion, it's a wash.
Thank you for now. Deputy Mayor Richardson. Oh, sir. Thanks. And through you, Chair. Just stop. Is there any existing infrastructure already in place on these roads? Y yes. So through you, Mr. Chair. So there is a uh, sanitary sewer, a water main uh, within that road network. Um, I'm not sure. Sorry. Sorry. I'll defer to Manager Sisson. Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. On Richard, we have water and sanitary because there are existing lots that front up to the end of Richard on the north side. And then on David, we just have water. Water was extended through to the limit of the property. And through you, Mr. Chair, just to add to that, there are, I believe there's also third party utilities, again, such as uh, street lights, telecommunications, uh, internet. Uh, you know, there's other infrastructures than just city owned infrastructures. And I believe I heard a question just through you, if I may, Mr. Chair. It would be just the ditching system that's there. There's no storm sewer in those locations. Do we, so as we move to this next phase, is it, um, are we looking at providing connection with that existing infrastructure that's there right now? So through you, Mr. Chair, so for the sanitary sewer, no, because the sanitary sewer is serviced independently. For the storm sewer system, no, because the storm sewer is serviced independently. Uh, for water, yes. So the water would connect through the extension of Richard and the extension of David, uh, mo mostly for functionality, right? In order to uh, have better chlorine residual, more pressure uh, distribution through the grid. So water would be, uh, is proposed to be connected uh, through Richard and David, but not as the only connections. There's gonna be multiple points of water connections to the existing water grid, let's call it. Member O'Reilly. Thanks very much. Uh, they mentioned a couple times about the one foot reserve. Uh, that was pretty common practice in those old subdivisions. I know we got all kinds of them around and, and when they extended the subdivision, and we did on our farm or riding lane, we just got rid of the one foot reserve and went beyond it. And yeah, that's common in other places. Uh, the other thing is to, um, the big thing with me is linkages. Like we've, we have a number of these, uh, these streets going into subdivisions that are hammerheads or what you can call them now, dead ends, and now and we have to extend them to certain, like Lindsay Street, for example. Look at the ones up here on uh, off of Wilson, and uh, there's a number up in the Pearson subdivision. On, 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 they come to a dead end, and they're naturally going to, would I be wrong in saying that most cases are going to be extended? We did, we did the Alcorn uh, streets up there. So, and, um, and the other question would be, they mentioned today that they talked to um, uh, fire and, and ambulance. I think there are some fire people, some ambulance people, and some uh, police officers that live in the subdivision, but I don't know that they speak for uh, those individual forces. I'm not putting them down for that, but would we typically go and ask those services about their comments for, uh, for, for linkages? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. So a couple comments, just taking notes. First, uh, the one foot reserve, uh, they're, they're primarily used for access to our corridor. So the road right away is a corridor, and we want to control the corridor. Uh, so there, it's very common uh, to put reserves where we don't want people accessing their frontage. So the, the one foot reserve essentially acts as a buffer uh, because there's rights for a right away. Once you put a one foot reserve, that one foot reserve is not considered right away, it's a reserve. Um, we also introduce one foot reserves at the end of phasing of subdivision. So as you see, Tribute has four or six phases, depending on what you look at. At the end of each phase, a road network, we typically put a reserve so that they can't arbitrarily connect the next phase before they complete their obligations of the first phase. So those are sort of the purposes for reserves, to control so that the city controls access and progress. Um, the second point you mentioned is uh, other dead ends. Uh, so the one comes to mind that you mentioned is Alcorn. Again, with the development of Alcorn, uh, Sandrine Hill Crescent, Victoria Avenue, were all connected as part of the larger grid. Um, and those were uh, south of Elkhorn, 
were probably developed in the same time frame, 50, 60 years ago, and now with the course of development, the road grid gets connection, connected. Uh, your third point regarding uh, comments from various agencies, uh, EMS, fire, police, that's all done through the planning process. So when a draft plan comes approved, the planning, the planning department coordinates all comments. They circulate to KRCA, engineering for comments. Uh, so they would have uh, corresponded or liaison with that appropriate EMS division and provided comments accordingly. Just to that effect, did I miss something in the report? Did they comment on that at this point? Mr. Chair, through you. Yeah. Uh, you haven't missed anything. Uh, we did have uh, some acknowledgement of sort of receipt, circulation uh, through our EMS, specifically through paramedics. Uh, comments were um, that overall there really was an opinion one way or the other in terms of improved response time or not. Um, that. Uh, there was, uh, if anything, a negligible uh, difference between going one route with road extensions or um, uh, or not extending the roads. Uh, so a, a neutral, a, a wash, um, to use to use the language of my colleague, Mayor Elmsley. Just I guess uh, through you to either Miss Barry or Director Rojas, if those connections weren't made, uh, you could still do the water connection underground and uh, there would be no harm, no foul to, to doing it, would there? Through you, Mr. Chair, as the uh, developer has mentioned, their plan is very flexible. So I'm not, oh, we can't see it. So I'm not sure if you could put up their, uh, Actual plan, yeah. So you can see the, it's hard to, I don't have the pointer, it's over there. Give me a second. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see the extension of uh, Richard up here and David up here is set up to be a 20 meter right away, which matches the existing on the other side. What the city does with that right away, we have some flexibility. So it doesn't really change the developer's draft plan. It would change the use of those two little uh, stub roads, let's call it, or stub pieces of land, where, where the, the city's um, suggesting they be used for right of ways. Regardless, they become our property. So we would still loop the water main. Um, the best use is right away, uh, according to city staff. Uh, but alternatively, we could, we could do a pedestrian walkway. There's other forms. We could do an emergency entrance. There's other forms. Uh, from a public works perspective as well, connecting those roads would enhance uh, maintenance operations. And I'm not sure if I, if I want Director Robinson to speak of it. No? Yeah. So again, so all comments have gone back to planning. And that's sort of the consensus that uh, all things being equal, those two connections to local roads is recommended. Thank you. Councillor Warren. Through you. Um, I was going to say the same thing about having, um, uh, if we didn't extend uh, Richard and David, we could have an active transportation corridor there and, and, and just have the services alongside that. So that was my comment. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Richardson. Thank you, and through you, Chair. I'm sitting here, I'm struggling. Um, you know, it's our job to provide good planning. So um, it's, I think all the, the original intent of this was always to uh, have the existing community connect to the new community. And I, you know, I think about operational when it comes to winter maintenance. You know, you have your snow plows that are having to, you know, flip around on the ends. Um, I just, and you know, and as we build this next section, you're going to have, um, you're going to have new schools, you're going to have parks, you're going to have some new amenities on that side. And I just, you know, I, I struggle and I understand, you know, where the community's coming from, but when we look at good planning, you know, our job is to provide those connections because the more connections you do have, the less traffic you have. So those are just my thoughts right now. Any further comments or questions? 
from committee, maybe a motion. I'll try one. That uh, we move it as printed, but that Richard and David Street uh, not be connected until phase three. And at phase three, when they are constructed and connected, uh, either bollards or jersey barriers or something uh, be constructed such that uh, there be no through traffic. That, but that in the future, should those connections be required or should they uh, be the, uh, asked for, for by the community, that it could be opened up. I don't think that uh, it will affect uh, Director Robinson's snow clearing. He's currently doing snow clearing in there. And I imagine with the size of this development with craft and tribute, he's probably going to have to add roots and uh, they can be taken care of on their own. It would allow us to put in the servicing that we require. It would still allow for active transportation uh, by bike or walking, but traffic could not go through until such time as uh, it was either required or deemed necessary. Um, so if uh, I can get a seconder, uh, we'll see where that goes. A seconder, Councillor Warren. Did you wish to speak to it, Councillor Warren? Through you, just briefly, um, I think this is a, a, a good resolution. Um, it uh, um, doesn't to tie us up if we have to in the future open it up it may have to come back but um, um, I like the uh, opportunity of an active transportation corridor through there so uh, that's why I'm supporting it thank you Deputy Mayor Richardson uh, what about um, having that put in and then we need to open it when the subdivisions complete I I don't know when that might be, and I I think that the council of the day uh, could make that decision. Did you want me to sum up? Any further discussion? Yeah. So is that a friendly or? No, he's not taking it. You're not taking it as a friendly. No. Okay, I just. I know all the people that live in there, and I know this is a really good subdivision, and people are spoiled. No, it's great. They have a great, it's a lovely thing. And um, I, ju I just find it difficult. It's a really difficult decision, but good planning is good planning. Because what do uh, we. S I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were asking for a friendly. I thought you were asking a question. No, as a friendly. As a friendly, I, at the end of Tribute North's build, Consideration. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, okay, I, so. Uh, okay. I gotta go back. Can I, can I clarify? I'm gonna clarify here a little bit. I'll show you. Oops, sorry about that. So, if we're moving towards building out the roads, putting, putting up the partitions as mentioned, would we consider, well, as soon as the next phase of that subdivision is done, then those should be coming down because we need to provide that connectivity. If you wanted to do it when at the end of uh, Tribute North, I, I would take it as a friendly. as a consideration. I under, North's already passed. Yeah, and I'm saying if you want the friendly, then it would be at the end of when Tribute North is built out.
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this so that the, the friendly is not being accepted. So, is there any is there any further discussion? And if there's not, then I'm gonna call the question. Um, is everybody clear on the motion? Are you clear on the motion, Joel? My understanding of the motion is that it would be as printed and that uh, bollards or barriers would be installed at the end of Richard and David Drive uh, until requested to be removed or required by council. Mr. Chair, through you, if this motion was to fail, we could move a follow-up motion? Okay, just for clarification. Okay, calling the question. All in favor of the motion on the floor? Any opposed? And that motion fails. Is there a follow-up? Uh, move as printed. Um, we move towards um, building out those roads and they will be opened when the uh, tribute, the subdivision is complete. Seconder for Deputy Mayor Richardson's motion, Member O'Reilly. Any discussion? Member O'Reilly? Oh, just a point of clarification. Are you north or are you south? But we're dealing with south right now. No, the, was the friendly south? Just south? It's going to be when south is built out. That's my clarification. Yes. Yes. That's going to be a long time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I realize that. But yeah, I just wanted, so it's when south is built out. Okay. okay. So, so that. I get this for the record. <laughs> Same as printed, um, and that the streets not be connected and that barriers be installed, and, but the barriers be removed at the completion of all four phases of Tribute South. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Calling the question, all in favor? Opposed? That carries. All right, that brings us to item 6.3 on the agenda, plan 2023-019, an application for amending the subdivision agreement and exemption from part lot control provisions of the Planning Act, uh, Maple Brook Homes, uh, Ms. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We are uh, here with two uh, relatively uh, seamless asks uh, to add three additional building lots into the town of Lindsay. Uh, we are at the intersections here of Dobson and Brock, uh, just south of Hutton, east of Logie to orient ourselves. Uh, this is a block. It's block 17 in a former plan of subdivision. That's 57M-792. The applicant has brought forward a request that part lot control exemption be lifted through the bylaw as appended to the staff report in order to create lots A1, B1, and C1 that you see uh, in Appendix B to your staff report and on the screen at the moment. This would also uh, require an amending agreement to the plan of subdivision. That amendment has been included as Appendix D and the effect would be to include these three new lots a1, B1, and C1 uh, with municipal addresses 44, 46, and 48 Dobson to abide by the provisions in the subdivision agreement. Maple Brook Homes is the proponent. They have submitted this request to the city. The city has reviewed, circulated for comments, and evaluated this request and agree uh, that it makes good land use planning sense complies with the provincial policy framework and the intent of the Town of Lindsay official plan. The draft amending subdivision agreement does require the owner to pay all of the city's reasonable legal costs incurred in the preparation and registration of the agreements together with the city engineering fee. The owner is also required to provide a letter of credit for 100% of the estimated cost of the works to the satisfaction of the 
directors of both development services and of engineering and corporate services. These three new building lots would be serviced with full urban municipal services, water, sanitary, and storm. The amending subdivision agreement does contain all the necessary conditions and warning clauses that were part of the conditions of the draft plan. And Mr. Chair, we support the request and ask that the amending agreement and parlock control exemption uh, proceed for final approval. Thanks. Okay, committee, any questions of uh, Manager Barry? If not, what is your direction? Uh, Member Barkwell? I'd like to make a motion that the application for amending a subdivision agreement and exemption from part lock control provisions, the Planning Act, Maple Brook Road Homes Limited, the report plan 2022-191019, amending the subdivision agreement and the exemption from the part lock control provisions of the planning applications by Maple Brook Homes Limited be received, that the part lock control law, bylaw substantially in the form attached as a Appendix C to Report Plan 2020-019 be approved and adopted by Council that the amending subdivision agreement for three lots, blocks, uh, Block 17, Plan 57M-792, the City of Kawartha Lakes, substantially in the form attached as a Appendix D to Report Plan 2023-019 be approved by Council and that the Mayor and Clerk be authorized to execute any documents and agreements required by the uh, approval of this um, agreement. Thank you. Is there a seconder for that uh, motion? Mayor Elmsley, any discussion? All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Uh, 6.4 on today's agenda, Plan 2023-031, an application to amend the Emily Zoning Bylaw 1996-30 at 7 Parkview Court. Um, Mark LaHaye, you are here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, members of the uh, Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, notice for this application uh, for zoning bylaw amendment was originally uh, given to each assessed landowner within 500 meters and all applicable agencies and departments. And a sign was posted on the property in accordance with the Planning Act. The statutory public meeting was held on February 8th of this year. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen here if I can. be there on everyone's screen now. Um, so the property is located at the um, west side of uh, on a corner lot on the west side of Emily Park Road and the south side of Parkview Court and the geographic township of Emily. The application proposes to rezone the property from a rural residential type 2 uh, zone to a rural residential type 2 exception 8 zone to also permit a small engine repair business to operate out of the existing detached garage on the subject land. Various documents and plans were submitted by the applicant in support of the proposed amendment, which have been circulated to applicable agencies and city departments for review and comment. Uh, staff has reviewed the documents that were prepared and filed in support of the application and evaluated these in the context of conformity and consistency with the rele relevant provincial and city of Kawartha Lakes um, policies and plans. Subsequent to the circulation of the application, no agency issues have been raised. During the public meeting process, concerns were raised relating to the commercial type business in a residential neighborhood, um, increased traffic and noise, potential for reduction in property values, uh, fuel um, containment and the effect on water wells and lack of payment of commercial property tax with the operation of the business. In response to the public concerns, the owner has provided additional information indicating that the business will be a drop off and pick up only and there will be no outside storage and all work will be serviced within the detached garage. 
This will ensure that the property will retain its residential character and be, will be well kept, which will maintain properties values. The subject property is the first property that's located at the corner of Emily Park Road and Parkview Court, and any limited additional traffic or noise will not infiltrate within the residential subdivision. Any fuels or lubricants that are kept on the property are no different than those that are typically used in household use and will be contained within the detached garage, will not affect neighboring wells. The business has been operating primarily as a mobile business in the past, with service and repair being conducted elsewhere and not on the premises. In response to staff comments, the owner has provided a floor plan and demonstrated that there is an existing suitable divider within the existing detached garage to separate the proposed business use and personal use, which limits the floor area of the business and upholds the intent of the official plan policy. Furthermore, staff have evaluated this proposal as a home-based business in the context of a home industry type use and considers the proposed small engine repair business appropriate with site-specific provisions. This includes a definition which limits the type of use, a maximum floor area, in this case 80 square meters, which limits the scale of the use, and a provision for no outside storage permitted related to the proposed use which would be in keeping with the residential character of the area. In consideration of the comments and, value and the evaluation contained within this report, and provided there are no further issues or concerns raised, staff respectfully recommends that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application be referred to council for approval. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, committee, any questions of Mark at this time? Seeing none. What are your wishes? Member O'Reilly? Chair, I move that we receive the report and move the recommendations of report plan 2023-031 part lot 12, concession five lot seven plan two geographic township Emily, City of Quartz Lakes identified as seven Park View Court, Lathang and Waldner Price D06 2022 032 be received. That the proposed zoning bylaw amendment substantially in the form attached as Appendix C to the report plan 2023 031 be adopted by council and the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute any documents required by the approval of this application. Is there a seconder for that motion? Mayor Elmsley, any discussion? All in favor? That carries. Thank you. That brings us down to item seven. Um, could we have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? Mm -hmm. Member Barkwell, seconded by Deputy Mayor uh, Richardson. All in favor? That carries. So the Planning Advisory Committee meeting is adjourned at 3.28 p.m. I Thank you for your time. I just want to say the suggestion about blocking off that road came from Deputy Clerk Joel Watts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did not come from my brain.